Good afternoon, everyone. We're going to get started. Um, my name is Ishel Rosal, and I serve as the Associate Vice President here at the University. And I'm very happy to welcome all of you today to this wonderful event, Whose Freedom, Whose Speech, The Future of Campus Community. We have a terrific panel um, lined up for you here today, which I will introduce in just a moment. But first, I wanted to share a few quick words about our office, which is the Office of University Life. The Office of University Life is a hub for university-wide student life information, resources, and discussions like today's. We bring together students, faculty, and staff from across Columbia's many schools to be in conversation about pressing issues of our time, like free speech on campus. Um, for the students in the room, I'd like to invite you all to also join us for Campus Conversations, which is a series of conversations that our office is hosting next week. And you can find out more about those conversations on our website, which is uh, universitylife.columbia.edu. You can also follow us on all of our social media platforms. And again, you'll find out more about all of our events um, via those avenues as well. Um, in just a moment, like I said, I will be introducing our terrific panel for you, but first I'd like to invite up Jonathan Friedman, who is a project director at PEN America and one of our co-sponsors for today's event. Thank you, Michelle. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming out. Just very quickly wanted to tell you about PEN America. We're the co-sponsors of this event. We are a literary organization. We're almost 100 years old. We're part of a network of PEN centers that exist in countries around the world. Our work at PEN America intersects the worlds of literature and human rights. We uh, celebrate the power of the written word, and we defend the civil liberties that make it possible. Um, our Campus Free Speech Project, which is what I direct, uh, has been in existence for the past three years. We do analysis of, of um, uh, current events, we do advocacy for certain cases, and we do campus engagements uh, like this one. This week we, we released a new report on campus free speech in the past two years, uh, dealing with um, challenges, new challenges that have arisen in the Trump era, uh, in the era of social media, and in an age where everything feels deeply polarized and politicized. Um, if you're interested in reading our report, it's called Chasm in the Classroom. You can find it on our website at www.pen.org, P-E-N. Uh, and otherwise, I'd be happy to speak with anyone uh, who's interested about our work after the event. Thank you so much for coming. All right. Hello again. So on to our panel. We are here today for a thought-provoking discussion about free speech on campus and the recent controversies that have impacted co colleges and university communities. Following the panel, we will have small group conversations led by student facilitators focused on how we can advance inclusion on campus and uphold free expression as a community value. So can the um, student facilitators raise your hands? There should be at least one. Great. So thank you all for, for agreeing to do this. We're, we're we are very appreciative of your partnership in this initiative, and um, as the conversations take off, you can look to those facilitators to keep um, to, to get you all started. It is now my pleasure to introduce our stellar panelists, who will help us add to our knowledge and perspective on this issue. Starting at the far end, we have Suzanne Nossel. She currently serves as the Chief Executive Officer of PEN America, a leading human rights and free expression organization. Since joining in 2013, she has doubled the organization's size and overseeing groundbreaking work on free expression in Hong Kong and China, Myanmar, Eurasia, and the United States. She is a leading voice on free expression issues in the United States and globally, writing and being interviewed frequently for national and international media outlets. And next to her is Tanya Kateri Hernandez, who is the Archibald R. Murray Professor of Law at Fordham University School of Law, where she teaches courses from anti-discrimination law to critical race theory. She is an internationally recognized comparative race law expert and a Fulbright scholar. She has previously served as a Law and Public Policy Fellow at Princeton University, Rutgers University, and with the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture, which is right here in Harlem. She was also named one of the 100 most influential Hispanics by Hispanic Business Magazine. And next to her is Musa Algarbe, Al Algarbi, who is a Paul F. Uh, Lazarusfeld Fellow in Sociology here at Columbia University and a senior fellow at the Heterodox Academy. He studies how knowledge is produced, transmitted, evaluated, and how thinking is shaped by the institutions and social contexts people find themselves in. 
He is engaged in and has been widely published on issues including Islam, terrorism, national security, foreign policy, race, policing, and social movements. And then Noah Dresner, who is our moderator today. He is an associate professor in higher education and program director of the higher and post-secondary education program at Teachers College, Columbia University, and founding editor of Philanthropy and Education. Much of his research looks at the societal benefits of higher education, including college and university's role in the cultivation of pro-social behaviors. He is a proponent of viewing higher education as a public good and not just as a benefit to the individual. So that is our panel. The way this is going to work, um, Professor Dresner will moderate the conversation among our panelists and then we'll open up to the students in the audience for questions. When we open up, he'll take questions in groups of three, so as you're listening, keep in mind whatever you might want to ask. And then once that is concluded, we will move into our small group discussions. So I'll turn it over now to Dr. Dresner. Excellent, thank you very much. Um, <coughs> Professor Hernandez, I want to start with you to open our conversation. Could you outline for us uh, in the audience uh, what's, uh, what speech the First Amendment protects what it doesn't protect. Make yes, sure make, sure our mic. <laughs> make sure our mics are on. <laughs> OK. Um, thank you uh, for inviting me. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, I think what often surprises people when they hear the actual details about the First Amendment um, is how it isn't as absolute as we sort of commonly talk about in the public discourse. Right? Um, and that its focus is really on the federal government. And so, you know, quick one quote, a sentence quote, right? What is the First Amendment? It simply says, Congress, Congress, Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech. Right? So it's principally about government censorship. How do universities get implicated into all of this is because when uh, private and public universities accept federal funding, right? they then are subject to federal regulation. So that's how it, they get involved in all this. Um, but even with that implication through the funding aspect um, from the federal government, the First Amendment has never been about saying anything you want at any time in any place. We have very clear carve-outs uh, in our jurisprudence. Uh, so run through a, a couple of lists, you know. We have carve-outs because we have some speech that the Supreme Court views as low value, right? and so that other social values, other constitutional values override them. So for instance, with commercial speech, yeah, when IBM wants to sell you a computer, they can't say just whatever they want yeah? uh, because they're trying to sell you something. That's not the same kind of value as someone engaged in political discourse. Uh, obscenity, that one used to be a big ticket item, not so much anymore, because, mm -hmm. you know, query, what does the community view as obscene? But at one time, right, that was viewed as a low value form of speech. Uh, defaming someone, you know, that is saying false things about a person that harms their reputation. That is not open to just freewheeling, spouting whatever you want about an individual. Uh, similarly, fighting words, that is to say, things by their very utterance inflict an injury, on an individual or tend to incite an immediate breach of the peace. And then there's the clear demarcation, right? words that incite someone to imminent violence. That's a very high threshold, right? but there are parameters. So not everything uh, that one wants to say is open uh, and uh, free of any form of government regulation. Excellent. I think that that uh, helps us. Uh bound our conversation today. So Ms. Nassau, I want to uh, focus in on higher education for the moment. And higher education is a time for students to explore new ideas, be exposed to new knowledge, and come into their own. Free speech and expression are part of that exploration. And at the same time, colleges and universities want to create inclusive environments where everyone feels safe to be themselves and to succeed. So sometimes that balance might great tensions. And I'm wondering if you could tell us a little bit um, about how do, how do we in higher education push back upon hate speech yet honor free speech at the same time and work within that tension? Yeah. Well, thank you. Thanks for having me uh, and for bringing this event together. 
that tension really has been sort of at the, at the heart of PEN America's work on these issues. Uh, it's our view that the university must be, continue to become more diverse, equal, and inclusive, that that's essential given the shifting gem demographics in our country and recognition that e equality and inclusion are essential to having a vibrant uh, and prosperous society but that we can achieve that without compromising robust protections for free speech and academic freedom. And we, in our work, are kind of constantly trying to explain how these principles can best be reconciled. So you bring up the question of hate speech. And we've seen a spike. The reason we did the report uh, that Jonathan mentioned that we issued earlier this week, we had done an earlier report in 2016 right before the election, actually, uh, called End Campus for All. And that was at the time when there were raging controversies over safe spaces on campus, trigger warnings, microaggressions. And in that original report, we kind of look at all of those issues and the case both for and against recognition of safe, safe spaces, for example. Uh, and then we, we try to explain how the underlying concerns that motivate a call for safe spaces can be respected and upheld, but without impinging upon freedom of speech. We did this new report because we felt so much had happened over the last couple of years. And one of the most important trends we described is this surge in hateful speech and also hate crimes and incidents, manifestations of hate on campus. Uh, and that, I think that's a product of our political moment and a kind of enabling environment that our political leaders have created. And what we argue, though, is that the, you know, Professor Hernandez has spelled out some of the categories of exception uh, to our free speech protections. And they also include threats uh, and harassment. Speech that falls into those categories is not protected. And that it's very important that those laws be enforced. We may need to look over time at how those laws need to be adapted. But that where, con where speech falls short of the threshold for harassment or defamation or a threat, even if it's obnoxious, offensive, objectionable, that the best answer is not to shut it down. And there are a whole series of things you can do. You can protest that speech. You can rebut it. You can ignore it. You can turn your back on it. You can counter message institutionally and officially to make clear that the university rejects that kind of offensive speech. But that the minute a, an institution shuts it down, cancels a speaker, uh, rescinds an invitation, that that climate that you talked about that we try to ensure exists on campus where all perspectives can be heard, uh, you know, that climate narrows. And so it's a, it can be a fine line to walk, but we think it's actually essential that universities take on these dual obligations and work out in each case the best way to uphold both of them. Yeah, in many in many ways, uh, the best way to combat hate speech is with more speech, rather than less. You know that's sort of the old adage, and I think uh, it's often true that uh, exposing why the speech and the ideas are wrongful, you know, having a, an upsurge of objection to something offensive that one person has said, you know, if the whole room rises up, and well, that can be very powerful. You know, I think it's also worth recognizing that that doesn't necessarily blunt all the harm that offensive speech can inflict at the individual level. And so it's not a perfect solution. Absolutely. Um, Professor Hernandez, like with everything in the US, uh, because of racism and white supremacy, the concept of free speech has not been equally provided to all of our citizens. Can you talk a little bit about how, our, uh, how has uh, race and our racist history impacted speech, speech codes, and the privileges of speech on different uh, members of our citizenry? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think sometimes there's a story about the story. Right? Um, and here, the story about the story uh, of the First Amendment is the adage, right? The best answer to speech you don't like is more speech. But the problem with that, of course, is that it doesn't actually take in uh, the way in which there aren't equal platforms for the more speech part. Uh, and that where a societal force uh, it deploying media outlets and what have you with lots of hate speech is not just harming some individual sort of, oh, I feel offended. Uh, when hate speech itself is actually a device for to ginning up 
a racially hostile social environment that then the FBI tracks this, right? We see the surge in the hate crime statistics uh, over these last couple of years of this administration. I don't think it's coincidental. You know, some might say, Professor, that's not causation. That's just correlation. Well, you know what? I don't need to see that many people coughing with cigarettes to say that correlation is good enough for me to say that I don't want to smoke cigarettes. <laughs> um, so similarly, I think we can draw some sort of very useful lessons from the correlation between the uh, exposure to hate uh, speech and also hate crime uh, escalation. Um, the other sort of story about the story uh, is that, oh, people of color shouldn't be against uh, absolutism with free speech because, you know, it's what helped the civil rights movement. So y'all should be thankful. Right? Uh, and here's the thing. Yes, it was helpful to have free speech right? uh, when uh, we were there fighting against uh, white supremacy uh, and the rhetoric of white supremacy. But, you know, the, fr the First Amendment was more like, I'd call it, a frenemy. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes it was helpful and sometimes it was stabbing in the back. Right? Uh, and indeed, Justin's, Justin Hansford, his colleague at uh, Howard Law School, has a very interesting article uh, where he talks about the ways in which when you delve deeper into the uh, deployment of the First Amendment with regards to civil rights movements for African Americans in the United States, uh, what you see uh, is a, a waxing and a waning in, in, a, in the same kind of social moment. Um, him looking at civil rights, he sees that what was being sort of furthered were placating messages. And so uh, some form of speech about desegregation, that could be a part of the First Amendment protection. But when there were uh, protests uh, with a sort of a more radical critique of police violence, as a form of white supremacy, that was not supported through the First Amendment. And we can sort of see uh, parallels today with Black Lives Matters. Um, and so, um, you know, obviously, I, you can see I'm very passionate about all this. I can go on and on and on. Um, but I don't want to, you know, take up more than my space on this <laughs> stage in order to truly have free speech. Um, uh, but I would just simply say that um, the history of it from a race perspective, indeed, Justin Hansford sort of calls the First Amendment a racial project. Quite provocative. I recommend you read the article. Perhaps we can uh, make sure that the uh, citation goes out to everyone in the room. Definitely. Excellent. Uh, Ms. Sarah Garvey, um, many conservative Americans are arguing, we see this in Gallup polls and in Pew polls all the time, that universities are this liberal bastion of elitism. You don't even have to go to a poll to hear that, <laughs> perhaps uh, on, a, uh, on a stump speecher rant uh, that some might be having uh, behind the microphone. Um, you're a core member of the Herodoxy, uh, Her Herod Herodoxy sorry, <laughs> Academy that argues that there's a lack of sufficient viewpoint diversity in American higher, educa higher education. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a little bit about that and what are some of the downsides of the lack of diversity in scholarship and how as scholars and scholar practitioners might we uh, counteract uh, that trend. Sure, so um, one thing that's important to recognize is that there's actually a bunch of different viewpoint diversity um, deficits on campus, right? So there's, uh, for instance, black and Hispanic students are dramatically underrepresented in social sciences and in social research. People from lower socioeconomic backgrounds are dramatically underrepresented in, in universities and among faculty. People from rural areas, but also conservative and religious people as well. Um, and what, what, one of the things that's interesting as we were studying um, this issue at Heterodox Academy is realizing actually how surprisingly interrelated a lot of these viewpoint diversity challenges are. So for instance, um, consider uh, you know, um, African Americans and Hispanics are more likely than whites on average to vote Democrat. But we also know from polling that they're more likely to be socially conservative and religiously observant than whites on average. Um, and so if you create a climate that's sort of hostile towards socially conservative and religious views, ironically, that's the, the people who would be sort of most affected by that kind of a climate might be people of color rather than whites, right? And, um, and you see this in some situations where like, um, in universities like, like Columbia and, um, and Harvard and you know, a lot of these, uh, even like, even within university spaces, more left university spaces, right? Um, that when you pull a lot of students of color and ask, do you feel like you belong here? Do you feel like you have a place here? Do you feel like you have a voice here? A lot of times they answer no, despite the fact that these spaces are very 
you know, um, uh, that a lot of the people who work in these spaces view themselves as allies and really want to be supportive. Um, so one of the ways in which the lack of uh, viewpoint diversity is an issue is that, it, is that it might actually undermine other forms of diversity that we already sort of um, care about, like demographic diversity. Now, uh, there are also challenges um, with regards to research. So for instance, um, if everyone shares the same basic um, predispositions on, within a field, say, um, on an issue, um, then you can have certain assumptions that go unchallenged, um, certain biases that creep into the way the study is designed or the way you analyze your data or the way, you know. Um, so for instance, I just, uh, I published a piece recently in the American Sociologist called Race and the Race for the White House on Social Research in the Age of Trump. And one of the things I show is that a lot of the work that's intended to prove that Trump voters are all a bunch of crazy racists, um, like a lot of that work is surprisingly not good. <laughs> so there's, um, there's, for instance, uh, a lot of the work is, suffers from glaring errors. There was one guy um, who published a, an essay that was trying to argue that Trump voters were especially motivated by race, but his own data actually showed that Trump voters were less racist by his own, by his racism scale that he developed, that Trump voters were less racist than Romney voters were. But he used this data to argue that they were especially motivated by race, right? Or in another instance, you see things like prejudicial study design. So there's like this whole kind of genre of research on Trump voters that basically the study design is like, what best explains why someone voted for Trump? Is it that they're more racist or sexist or authoritarian or ignorant, right? And like when you turn that around, we would never tolerate a study that's like, why did someone vote for Hillary Clinton? Is that they're communists or they hate Americans <laughs> or something like that, right? If, if, if any study was designed like that to explain Hillary Clinton voters, we would obviously recognize that as prejudicial and sort of incorrect. Um, so that's one of the ways that the lack of viewpoint diversity can undermine um, research. But uh, critically, it, the lack of engagement with people who are not academics and not on the left also undermines the impact of social research, right? And this matters because most of us who get into these fields do it because we don't just want to like understand social problems in some like abstract sense, but we want to help move the meter on these issues that we care about. We want to actually like instantiate change in the world. And it's very difficult to do that if you're only engaging with other academics and other people on the left. Um, and, uh, and I wrote an essay in Open Democracy that was explaining this a little bit more. Um, so it can undermine the quality of research, it can undermine the Im impact of research, and it can also undermine the viability of research. So people tend to, we know from a lot of sociological research that people tend to disinvest in institutions that they don't see themselves reflected in, that they don't feel like they have a value or a stake in. And you see this in a lot of red states. Um, Republican legislatures are moving to slash especially the fields that they, are, that they are dramatically underrepresented in, the humanities and the social sciences. Um, and uh, and the, ironically, again, um, well maybe not ironically, but unfortunately, um, the, these, um, both the public universities that tend to bear the brunt of these um, defunding moves are mo more likely than most to hire faculty of color and to serve low income students and rural students and, and all of these other students who are underrepresented in the campus. They're the ones who are seeing their budget slashed from, um, and then also the, a lot of these fields that are being defunded in the humanities and social science. It's work on, on race, gender, and sexuality and stuff that's bearing the brunt of these cuts, right, in these attempts to, so this is a sense in which a lot of us who, who wanna move the meter on a lot of these um, social issues that we're passionate about because we're not folding in and engaging with a broad spectrum of, of like a broad enough spectrum of the American public, we're actually undermining the ability for our work to matter and for our work to even, in some cases, persist, right? Uh, so it's a big problem. Yeah, I, th I think it's, uh, most academics would acknowledge that it's impossible to remove all bias from research, but, that, but also um, being able to be cognizant of your biases and talk about how those might be uh, impacting research design and the limitations of your research, but also having strong peer review that catches some of these questions uh, prior to uh, publication and prior to you then, then being able to evaluate it could well, be uh, beneficial. Yeah, but this is actually why you need, um, why you need more diversity because like, so for instance, uh, the, 
the essays that I talk about in my Trump Studies paper in the American Sociologist, like these are essays that were published by, by you know, really smart people. Like these aren't hacks. These aren't like they they know better, right? But these errors are getting through, and they're making it through peer review by a bunch of other people who also know better. And then they're being cited in many cases in prestigious journals by other scholars who know better, and cited in media um, by other people who know better. Like who would catch these errors otherwise? But they're, it's hard for them to see you know, uh, these mistakes, like they literally can't see them sometimes because they're all starting from the same um, uh, starting place. And, 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 and so this is why, like, um, you, in order for peer, peer review to be super effective, it's much more effective when you have this kind of adversarial relationship with people who have different methods, different, um, uh, um, different sort of starting assumptions. Mm -hmm. Um, that's when, when peer review is most effective, and it breaks down if there's too much homogeneity in, in, within the people signing and reviewing. It sounds like you're describing a, an echo chamber in a, in a way. Absolutely. Professor Hernandez? Well, I mean, I would certainly agree that viewpoint diver uh, diversity is important in every space, every public space, uh, let alone the uh, university. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that undermines the um, importance, at least from my perspective, <laughs> of thinking about a responsibility that we have, have as a society and that the universities have with regards to regulating hate speech, right? Oh, um, you know, you know I, I think that we can uh, disagree, for instance, about um, whether we think affirmative action is a policy that is most effective um, at uh, pursuing uh, inclusion uh, in a university or elsewhere. But when a conversation about affirmative action then turns into a denigration of particular groups, particularly, uh, uh, as they say in Europe, vulnerable minority groups, right? Mm -hmm. uh, especially vulnerable groups. That then is no longer about uh, furthering a discourse or a search for truth um, or a sharing of knowledge, right? That then becomes about subordinating a group, right? You know, that, that hate speech is the language of racism. It is the way in which, you know, how do we have a Rwandan genocide? It's preceded by hate speech. How do we have a Holocaust? It's preceded by hate speech. Indeed, our international norms regulating hate speech, which the US doesn't ascribe to, but the rest of the world tends to, and we're, we are a um, exception uh, with regards to this, um, that those international norms were purposely uh, thought through as a response to the way in which people understood at the time, right, that the Holocaust was facilitated by the hate speech, yeah. right? Um, and so, you know, have viewpoint diversity, I'm in agreement with you. Um, but I think that when it carries over into, oh, then that means we should eat, not even consider the realms of where hate speech is the language of racism, that's where I think we miss an opportunity for actually furthering equality in our society. Absolutely. At Heterodox Academy, we have this distinction that we draw mm -hmm. about how viewpoint diversity and um, open inquiries and open inquiry are um, instrumental rather than absolute good. So, like, why do we want more viewpoint diversity in the academy? At least for us as an organization, what we're fundamentally trying to do is improve the impact and quality of research and teaching. Right. So, um, to the extent that viewpoint diversity and uh, open inquiry furthers those goals, the more, the more that, um, then it's great. But to the extent that it cuts against those goals, then that, that, that's a place where you might have a conversation about like appropriate, right? And these are um, decisions that have to be made within sort of communities of inquiry relative to their needs and circumstances and mm -hmm. things like that. We also don't believe that it's our role or anyone's role to degree on, on high, you know, what works for everybody as yeah. far as these things go. Okay. But, uh, but yeah, no, absolutely, I think that, um, there are circumstances where a lot of speech um, is not enhancing to what we're trying to achieve at universities, and uh, and that's something that's worth reckoning with. And but uh, as, as Suzanne pointed, um, there are many ways to push back other than sort of formal censorship as well, right? And this is um, uh, and this is another thing that's yeah, important. Yeah, just yeah. to come into this part of the conversation. Uh, well, I agree with you. I think where this becomes so difficult is really, you know, what the boundary lines for hate, hateful speech are. And, you know, there's some hateful speech where I think it's obvious. I mean, somebody using uh, a, a racial slur that everybody knows is a slur and using it clearly 
as a slur in anger, you know, directed at a member of the protected group. That's for the easy case. I don't think many of us uh, would have a problem if that, for example, subjected a person to s discipline on campus. But you know, you get into many gray areas. Uh, you know, for example, you bring up uh, hateful speech and the role that it played uh, in in the lead up to the Holocaust. Well. You know, there's a raging debate now about uh, there, there's a piece of legislation in Congress uh, called the Anti-Semitism Awareness Act, and you know the language of the act actually deals with the definition of anti-Semitism, and it references a broad definition that uh, runs through a whole bunch of historic examples of anti-Semitic tropes that have been brought up over time. You know, with the, the idea of kind of educating people that, uh, you know, talking about Jews in certain ways, you know, evokes these anti-Semitic tropes mm -hmm. that have been used over time. For example, Jews dual loyalty. You know, are they really loyal to the United States? You know, and the implication that uh, Jewish Americans are unfaithful mm -hmm. citizens in some way. You know, that's part of it. But another part of it is uh, around Israel and the relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. And there is a relationship between anti-Zionism and anti-Semitism. That doesn't mean that all criticism of Israel is anti-Semitic. Uh, so when you get into parsing it, you know, th there can be uh, on one person's side uh, a wish to you know, paint a relatively broad and protective brush. Uh, you know, let's say a Jewish student who feels unsafe in an environment where Israel is being harshly criticized. They believe that's anti-Semitic. They believe that's an attack on them personally. There could be another student who, uh, let's say, is a Palestinian rights advocate. And they believe that, uh, y y that to suggest that their speech critical of Israel is anti-Semitic is to silence them. And that, in fact, they're the one who's speaking for the, uh, the vulnerable group in this instance, and that they have the right to speak out. And so you know, these interests and rights you know, don't always fit together neatly. And that's why I think we have to err on the side of trying to allow as much speech as possible. And where there's a legitimate debate to try to answer noxious speech through other means, whether it's more dialogue, counter speech, objecting, protesting, rather than punishing, let's say, that student who criticizes Israel you know, or the student who tries to, uh, you know, shut that down on the basis that it's anti-Semitic, because it's it's really tough to parse some of these issues. You know, for example, I brought up the racial slur. You know, there's the easy case where it's being used as a racial slur, but what about the case where, and uh, you know, we've had many of these cases um, come to our attention with with respect to the N word, where it's used in a pedagogical context. Uh, a, a professor utters the word, um, but in re you know, relation to Huck Finn or to a film that they're showing uh, about a moment James in Baldwin. history. Mm -hmm. Sorry? Or even reading James or, Baldwin. Or James Baldwin, and, right. Um, and they, you know, it, the, the word is used in the titles of some books. It, you know, but if the professor utters that title aloud to some students, that can feel very injurious. And, 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 the, and there may be very little distinction. That, students mind between the use of it, the mention of it in a, in a pedagogical context and the use of it as a slur. They may not really abide that distinction or experience that distinction and yet in the professor's mind that distinction is sacrosanct. They never use it as a slur. They, you know, be, they'd be horrified um, but they've kind of used it pedagogically may, in some cases for years. I mean I'm thinking of one instance at the University of Chicago Law School where recently uh, First Amendment professors have you know, been using the word for years actually to illustrate fighting words and uh, a, a conflagration over fighting words and this year his students came to him and they were deeply offended and he's, he's decided he's not going to use it anymore because he understands it has a, an impact very different than what he thought. Um, and I think that's fine, but I'm also very glad he wasn't punished for it. I think that's what becomes sort of frightening. The students may have been extremely upset if they turned to the university and the university said, you know what, you're suspended. I think that would have been a really alarming result. I think we have to take into account considerations of intent and context and complexity and not rush to uh, you know, bans and prohibitions on uh, speech that, that uh, is or could be construed as hateful. I mean, I think that, oh, oh, if I may, <laughs> or, or do I have? You have. Two seconds? Two seconds, I, seconds yeah. I, 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 short <laughs> short response seconds. is just, I don't think regulating means that it has to be a blanket. 
prohibition that then precludes any consideration of nuance and context or what have you. Um, though I don't think pedagogy is off the table, right? And I'm speaking from the, the, the side of the table as, you know, the one who would be on the chopping block, right? Um, why? Because I think that professors need to also be attentive to when they are using things just to be gratuitous. Right. Um, so, for instance, uh, I remember being in criminal law classes as a first uh, as a law student and having an instructor who m every example that he had for what something would be a crime was a rape. Okay. And the thing is, yes, rape is a crime. Yes, it should be talked about. But when it's every single example, I'm sorry, that is no longer about pedagogy. That's about his stuff. Right? Uh, and his stuff is hurting me, right? His stuff is uh, sort of furthering uh, the way in which women are constantly a subject to violence or of a particular sort. And so, I, you know, I'm not saying that that means, okay, that person should have been fired, but I don't think that, I also think that regulation can meet further inquiry uh, and com conversation with the instructor. Right? So I mean, I think there's a- I don't uh, think pedagogy should be off the table okay. either. I mean, I agree with you that uh, I think there is a duty that you have if you're at the front of the classroom mm -hmm. to understand you know, who's in the classroom and what backgrounds are coming from and how words are understood and the generational differences that may exist between you and uh, your students. So I agree with that. I think, you know, the question, I, and I, I think we're basically in agreement that yeah, if something should be done. There should be a discussion, a conversation, a consideration, mm -hmm. looking into it. But I think where the word regulation comes in, so the implication can be quite chilling to speech. I mean, if you're sort of worried that you might be brought up on discipline, if you skate anywhere close to a certain line, you know, you're going to keep your circles pretty narrow. Uh, and I think that's you know, that, that cuts against, you know, the rest of what we're talking about, which is trying to keep the university as a, a forum for a broad range of ideas, mm -hmm. even ideas that are provocative, out of favor. I mean, let's talk about Trump. So much about Trump kind of veers into language that can make people feel, you know, maybe the way you felt in that classroom when he went on and on about rape. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there's a lot about Trump that's triggering to people, and yet, it is, you know, for better or for worse, it's political speech, you know, in, in uh, 2019 <laughs> America. And so, uh, you know, we, we have to acknowledge that. And I think ultimately, you know, the answer is not to try to discipline people who, you know, let's say talk about the president's ideas when we're living in a political environment when those ideas are being espoused from the White House. So as moderator, I need to jump in because 45 minutes goes by like that, and we've already hit it. Mm -hmm. uh, wow. Wow, I know. So, and I had six or seven more questions right now <laughs> that you all prepared for. So I, what can we do? But I do, I do want to have one. I'm going to use the, since I have the mic, I'm going to ask one last question before we turn it to the audience, because I think it actually draws nicely to all the conversation that we have here in terms of in the end, higher education is about the exploration of ideas and learning, right? So when we get into this conversation of policing speech or free speech or regulation, there's a potential um, to lose that ability to learn and to engage in um, disagreement and discourse that could be positive. There are certainly ways for it to go bad as well. And I think that we all, we, we're in agreement that there's examples of it going bad. But how do we actually foster, in a short amount of time of, of answers, but how do we actually foster that positive aspect of disagreement and learning from each other and ac positive academic conflict uh, that academia has been based on for hundreds of years? I feel like we've lost it in the United States and perhaps around the world where we're tweeting for 280 <laughs> characters or whatever it is and things like that and we're, and we're living in echo chambers as opposed to in dialogue with each other. So I know we only have a few seconds, but how do we solve it? <laughs> well, the first thing I would say is that um, often when the idea of, you know, we need to foster people having disagreements uh, in the classroom um, in order to promote learning. Um, I think it's important to add on the extra layer of who's learning. 
right? Uh, so uh, some things are so provocative that they actually are hate speech, mm -hmm. in, in, in my view. Right? Um, and when that happens, you've shut down the learning of the students of color in the classroom. Oh, absolutely. Right? So you have prioritized the learning of other students over some of the most vulnerable in the classroom. Um, I don't think that that's something the university should be doing. It's not what right? I was asking. Right? And, and I'm not saying this, that's what you were saying, <laughs> but that's what I'm going to make clear, right? Uh, because sometimes I think that the reaction to the idea of, well, oh, you know, as a university, we need to be so toughening up the students and making sure they can have hard conversations or whatever, as, as if that's an excuse for then shutting down a whole substantial portion of class, or what we hope to be a substantial portion of class, if it is diverse. Yeah. Uh, if it's not, then I guess it's not so much as much of an issue, I don't know. Uh, but <laughs> in the ideal scenario. Uh, my short answer to that answer is Mari Matsuda, a critical race theorist, would say we should always look at what deepens subordination, right? that that should be mm -hmm. our parameter. And she has like a simple three-part question. Right? She asks, is the message of one of racial inferiority? Right? Is the message one that's persecutory, hateful, and degrading? I mean, again, we can talk about Palestine, Israel, without having it be persecutory, hateful, et cetera. Right? It could actually be political engagement. Um, and then is the message directed against a historically oppressed group, you know, the least powerful? Those three factors are ones that can sort of be very helpful guideposts in sort of sifting through what feels uncomfortable but is a productive exchange and what is actually a deepening of inferiority and a harm of gets equality, which the First Amendment's not the only amendment, people. The 14th Amendment also exists. Why should mm -hmm. the First Amendment always take priority? Meaning the right to equality for us all. Absolutely. I, mean, I would say you know, one thing that we've done and that I would encourage is trying to foster dialogue across people who really disagree. Mm -hmm. uh, and you know, we probably disagree a little bit on this panel, but uh, you could get a group that would be uh, you know, far more kind of reflective of a, 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 you know, a free speech absolutist and, you know, somebody's really argued for uh, restricting and, and believes vociferously in restricting speech, you know, and on any number of other issues. Uh, you know, Israel-Palestine is one example. It's, it's really hard to have a civilized conversation. There's a lot of dialogue that goes on that is sort of one side talking to themselves and actually trying to put together events where people are willing to speak to one another and you have a strong moderator who can keep it under control and you really make clear the point of this is you know not for uh, people to just uh, propound their views but really we're trying for an exchange because it's always enlightening and actually people really enjoy it I mean people like to be sort of tested in that way with somebody who is a real antagonist mm -hmm. and there's a certain charge in the room mm -hmm. when that kind of conversation happens so I think uh, demonstrating through practice that that is possible, uh, you know, is 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 one piece of this. Yeah, and I think that. Quickly. Yeah, well, and I think that demonstrating through practice thing is also important because, to the extent that you haven't really engaged, like if if someone hasn't really engaged, say, with a conservative or with a, a Christian or with a pro-Israel person or a pro-Palestine person, like to the extent that they're caricatures that you've seen on the internet or on TV or something like this. Um, it's really easy to impute um, a bunch of things about their motives and what they're trying to do or whatever. But uh, when, you're, when you see them face to face and when you're able to engage with them in, reason, like, in a reasonable way, just the, the, the fact of seeing someone that you disagree with there and just talking to them and realizing, just being able to see firsthand, like, not in an abstract way, but like in a real way, like this is a real person who's maybe not purely evil or crazy or stupid, like, <laughs> like that in itself can be huge, right? Even, even regardless of whether you change your mind or not. And this is one thing too, is I think a lot of times we expect too much out of a lot of the conversations we have when we're talking about people who are engaging across difference. The, the objective shouldn't necessarily be to come to, to have these two people who are on polar ends and they end up coming in the middle or, or something like that, or one person converts to the other side, a lot of times these differences will remain because they're deep and profound and they're not easily resolvable. And that's fine, and we need to be able to live with those um, contradictions sometimes. But, uh, and I think this is like one of the mistakes that we make sometimes when we're trying to encourage people to engage across differences. We sort of raise the stakes of the conversation too high, or we expect too much out of the conversation. That, 
this is a dialogue that's supposed to resolve the issue here and now. Israel, Palestine, you're pro, you're against. Let's sit down and settle it, right? <laughs> and that's not the way. And like this kind of winners losers kind of model is not is not helpful for understanding things usually. Can I offer up just an example of this? Very um, quickly, because I'm getting on, glasses. On YouTube, <laughs> on YouTube, I just wanted to put out the, it, it, what you're what you're offering up. You can see Cornell West. He's constantly in, in dialogue with Robbie George, mm -hmm. a very conservative figure, both, uh, I mean, both socially and religiously um, at the Princeton University campus. And the two of them have nothing but love for each other. And, and um, you know, Cornell is a, a Bernie bro, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and so it, it, there are different ends of, diff of many different topics, but they often Absolutely. are in conversation with each other. Look for their YouTube conversations, and I think that will be a helpful model for seeing how People can talk across difference, but they can do it in a productive and a respectful manner. I think uh, respect, respectful dialogue actually can change the needle. It's not going to change the needle on one conversation for mm -hmm. sure, but if you uh, have multiple of them, slowly uh, differences can be made. So that's really good. And I know that we have some questions, so uh, I'm going to turn to the audience. Great. Sure. Hello, thank you so much. This was a really cool example of exactly what we were talking about. Um, my name is JP, I'm at the GS School, and my question is this. A lot of people say we need to have, there's been an ongoing sort of like uh, this thing, we need to have a conversation about race. And there's some interesting research that I've read in, in Jonathan Haidt's book, who I think, believe, was one of the founders of the Heterodox Academy, that m the more we highlight race, for example, in things like a conversation about race, perhaps, the more racist it makes people, as opposed to focusing on uniting factors like we are all Columbia students or we're all Americans. As a person who merely wants to achieve the goal of less racism and more unity, how do we reconcile these two things? Thank you. Okay. We're going to take one more question, and then we'll uh, group them together for answers. Oh, okay. um, my name is James. I'm at the School of Social Work. Um, I, I wa want to. Well, was thinking in my head while all of you were in dialogue and conversation, where do you see the positiona positionality of calling out and calling in, and how it's useful in this, uh, in the ramifications of this conversation? Do you want to clarify uh, for everyone what you're talking about between the differences between calling out and calling in? I think calling out is much more you see in. Um, in activism where you call out a certain hate uh, that's being verbalized and calling in um, is it's, it's just that expression you calling that person out and singling them saying this is wrong da 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 calling in is much more compassion and um, and much more of a way of teaching moment for an, exa uh, for an example, the students could have called out the professor at University of Chicago with administration, but instead they called him in. Yeah. Yeah. Bring them into dialogue. Mm. Yes, mm. Excellent. bringing them in. Wonderful. Uh, who would like, we have two questions, but in, in some ways they, they could be combined nicely into one, but uh, we can take them either separately or together. Yeah, uh, if you don't mind, I'll. Yeah, so the, um, the thing about, say, focusing on differences and fo versus focusing on a superordinate identity or, or shared identity, um, it's not necessarily an either or, right? So it's not like we have to ignore differences between race and a focus on, on what unites us as Americans. It's like the, it's that it has to be instead um, a, that the focus, that you have to establish this sort of superordinate identity first before you can dive into the differences. So if you're starting with, here's how we're different, um, and uh, then that's a lot harder to, then it, then it can polarize people, right? But if you start by building this bridge of what we share in common um, as a starting place, not the only place, <laughs> right? Uh, and build a foundation of trust or build building on a common goal that you guys have, then it's a lot easier then to wade into those differences and to really, you know, get into what makes you, you know, what separates you and, and or, or what makes you different. Um, so it's it's more about a sequencing rather than an either or. Um, and then, uh, and um, similarly, I guess that actually does does relate in, in some in a lot of ways. I, I mean, I think that almost always it's it's more valuable and effective to call in rather than call out like um and and this is one thing that i advise people like if you're trying to 
convince someone of something like, say you, you're, you're arguing with someone who's on the opposite political party of, of you um, as you about some critical issue. If what's required for them to come around to your position is for them to admit that they're somehow fundamentally evil or depraved or stupid or something like that, like they're just not going to get there probably, right? Um, and this is another case of sort of expecting too much out of the conversations or demanding too much from conversations. Um, and I think, uh, so I think it's usually, I mean, sometimes you, it, it's appropriate to call out though, right? If there's a wrong that's done, sometimes, uh, and it's a severe wrong, it's important sometimes to draw attention to it and to draw the community's attention to it really and to seek rectification. But I think generally calling in is more effective. Um, uh, yeah. uh, two, just two points. Um, with regards to sort of this idea of, if we talk about race, then we're fomenting race, racism, right? You know, you talk about it, you're the racist. <laughs> a viewpoint. What the actual social science shows is that it's the opposite. It may feel counterintuitive, but it's actually the opposite. Um, this may feel like an odd example I will give, but the Harvard Business School <laughs> has had a very interesting study. Um, if you Google Harvard Business Review and uh, Guess Who Game, those things together, you will find the study um, in which what they found was that when people in experiments um, I don't know too much to go into, but what the experiment was. But in any case, when they do experiments where people are ignoring the racial identities of those involved, they are undermining their efficacy and their decision making. Whereas the people who are transparent about focusing on issues of race and racial difference in order to be much more um, forward, uh, uh, they are more productive. It's, it's a very fascinating study, yeah, and, and, and many others could do it as well. Um, mm -hmm. And this is a case where they have a shared goal too, right, in a lot of these experiments, mm -hmm. right? Um, and mm -hmm. so this is the thing, is when you, have that, when you have that base shared thing, then it makes it easier, and it's actually better to, to focus on, uh, you know, to wade into some of that stuff, I think. And then the calling in, calling out, I would simply say that I agree, of course, calling in is a good thing, right? But sometimes we need to call out in order to acknowledge the humanity of the people who are being attacked. Right, so meaning, if I just respond with a call in to something quite outrageous, mm -hmm. I think that is a way of saying to the people who have been attacked, oh, well, you know, it wasn't that bad. So let's just be this, you know, I think sometimes you have to call out in order for a community that's under attack to feel like their humanity has been acknowledged. Especially if it was a very public attack. Exactly. Well, and uh, just the last, I, mean, I know there's more questions, but I, I, the only thing I would add uh, I agree with much of what's been said is I, I always find sort of when white people are saying like, you know, we really shouldn't be talking so much about race and identity politics. I always find that rings kind of hollow. Like it's, it's sort of, it's, you, you don't really get to decide, you know, when, when, when there's a, you know, a, a convergence around that, uh, you know, maybe, but, um, you know, where people feel like they need to talk in these terms, they have a very compelling reason to talk in these terms. I think you're better off kind of hearing that out than trying to suggest that uh, you know, it ought to be a different conversation. Yeah, I think that we always have to be thinking about the power dynamics and who has the power to, to start a conversation and, and, and to call for the end of a conversation and who doesn't have that power. Right. I so, mean, white people do not have the power to call for an end to the conversation about identity politics. And it actually was a call for the end of the conversation about it right after reconstruction. Yes. <laughs> so it's sort of kind of funny. The New Yorker now has a fascinating article about, you know, uh, was uh, the restoration actually, you know, preordained? And uh, it's a funny, well, I don't know what call it funny, an interesting analysis of how even back in the 1800s was enough with the race conversation. Uh, so it's kind of ironic that we're still having that reaction today. And it still persists today, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, so our hour is up. Can we take one more question? We'll start here because I saw your hand earlier, and then we'll go. We'll go. Right, right, right. Okay. Uh, hi, uh, I'm Eleanor, I'm professor of economics. Uh, I have kind of three short, really short points. First, uh, your example of Nazi Germany is actually factually incorrect because Weimar Republic had very strict anti-hate speech uh, laws that were prosecuted and people went to jail for it and it made them, the Nazis, martyrs. It did not stop the conversation at all. So if, you, if the idea is somehow, let's have a rule on the book and that will solve the problem, it does not. In fact, it might exacerbate it. Now, two, two examples from Colombia, though. First, uh, and that's kind of aimed at uh, Penn, 
uh, because they made a statement. Colombia just yesterday or today or two days ago uh, uh, suspended or postponed indefinitely a conversation about Turkey that was going to be held here at the behest of the provost's office. It was just kind of unilaterally, almost at the last minute, a conference about Turkey was blocked and stopped. Uh, and, and so we should kind of ask the question, why and who and whose pressure and who is entitled to do that? And lastly, for students here, perhaps to, to uh, since most of you are relatively new here probably, Three or four years ago, in the engineering school, uh, a professor was suspended because an anonymous student evaluation said that he had made some jokes that were inappropriate. He was suspended almost immediately, and then the tapes were being, sh being kind of investigated, looked at, the taping of the uh, lectures, and the university tried really hard to find something. They couldn't find anything and eventually he was reinstated, but the harm was done. Now, this is basically, when you talk about kind of like looking at people's pedagogy, is some of the things that will happen. And you have to be kind of like, be able to define where the limits are and how this would be, go be working itself out. Do you want to take a double? Or yes. Or just mm -hmm. uh, my name is Sydney Johnston. I'm with the School of uh, General Studies. Um, my, my question is to uh, your, your point as well, that we, uh, while I heard a definition and the parameters of what is um, within and without the confines of free speech, I didn't hear a definition for hate speech. And as we understand this pendulum of history is uh, constantly oscillating, how do you define hate speech in such a way that it doesn't become weaponized by whichever group is in power at that moment in time and it can transcend it. And um, my, I will disclose my own position. I think that um, given, given this um, property, it is, it is quite um, da dangerous to um, make it so, so specific um, such that it, it can be used um, in this way. Unfortunately, that has to be our, la our last set of questions because we do need to move on to the other part. But mm -hmm. uh, I think that they actually uh, fall together nicely. So okay. who wants to go first? Um, if yeah. I may? Go ahead. Um, so with regards to the Nazi Germany example, um, I would disagree with you about um, the sort of relevance of the uh, legal framework, right? That is to say, yes, there can be hate speech laws, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are effective hate speech laws or that they're enforced in a particular way um, that produces a furthering of equality as opposed to an impairing of equality, right? So meaning there can be law in the books, but it's all about the nuance in the laws and also the way they are enforced, that all those things matter, right? That law itself on its own doesn't sort of yield results. Um, and that all the um, literature and historical analyses uh, of the period uh, speak to the role of the use of hate speech to actually demonize and naturalize uh, the targeting of the Jews right, and, and others. So, uh, so there's that. Um, the other thing is that with regard to university regulations, um, there needs to be nuance, right? So meaning to have regulation doesn't mean that you then shut down all inquiry um, or have automatic suspensions, right? You know, universities have a particular way of reacting, but they need not react in that way. Um, and I don't think that the answer is, oh, we could have selective enforcement, so sh we should have no enforcement. We have problems all the time with selective enforcement with regards to uh, criminal law uh, against people of color, but we don't have calls for like removing criminal laws off the books, right? meaning we should deal with the issues of selective enforcement. Um, so with regards to um, you know, trying to figure out a definition that is operative, you know, we tend to think that in the United States that if we f focus on regulating hate speech that like, you know, we're going to sink into the ocean as opposed to sort of looking at outside and seeing that, well, there are lots of other nations that have been regulating hate speech. Some do it well, some don't do it so well, so I'm not trying to say it's always perfect, right? Um, but they have, their democracies have not fallen apart, right? And they haven't become totalitarian regimes because they care about regulating hate speech. Um, so I think I'll leave it at that. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so I'll give you one um, conceptualization that comes from the international human rights framework, right? Sort of a, a sort of a global standard. It's about looking at whether or not the hate speech is con is connected to discrimination, violence, messages of inferiority, hatred, persecution. Right? So it's got the prohibition of expression that most interferes with the rights of subordinated group members to participate equally in society, uh, to maintain their basic sense of security and worth as human beings. So that's sort of one better entry into it. Um, if you want to know more about the international human rights, I'd be happy to share that information with you. So I've been getting the time's up signal multiple times <laughs> now, so I, I have to cut this off. This has been a great conversation I, and obviously uh, food for thought for the rest of the discussion that's going to go on for the next hour. Um, and I just want to thank all of the panelists for uh, providing such more. And clearly, we could have gone just two hours in our conversation up here. But uh, we're going to engage in some good dialogue now as well. And if you could all join me in thanking Noah and the panelists together. Thank you so much.